Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion of Sartre's being in nothingness now. Uh, we're going to turn to the section on the body. It's an extremely rich section. It's only one chapter in this huge book, but it, it's worthy of being a book in its own right. Indeed, uh, Merleau-Ponty's Phenomenology of Perception, written a few years after this, is largely a just sort of expanded version of this chapter. Um, and Merleau-Ponty's last essay, actually, the last published essay, I and Mind, uh, you know, reads all, again almost like a, just a restating of a lot of the points here. So this this uh, the stuff Sartre says here is enough to build a whole a whole you know philosophical career on. Uh, it's so rich, uh, but we're I really I'm only going to try to go through it quickly, obviously, and try to just hit on a couple of of key points. Uh, but I just want to underline how how um, how rich it is, how, how deeply you could explore these things and how much you could get out of it. It's about the body. Uh, it's also got an awful lot of stuff about sensation and perception, awful lot of stuff about feeling, affectivity, a really nice section on pain. Uh, it's got the basis for a philosophy of race, uh, philosophy of gender, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so it's really, it's really, um, it's really powerful. Uh, funny, I mentioned Merleau-Ponty, but probably I'm, I'm going to talk about Aristotle and Kant more than anything else because they're the figures uh, whose analyses in many ways come closest to the things Sartre is talking about here. But anyway, uh, let's get on with it. I want to begin by looking at this picture. Um, this is a uh, uh, by a great painter, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, you don't see that many women represented in the history of Renaissance art, but, uh, but she is. And uh, I particularly like her paintings, aside from the fact that they're just, you know, really good. Her works are, are really, um, really, uh, valuable for study of gender and sexuality and things like that, women's status of women. Anyway, this is uh, Artemisia Gentileschi's uh, painting of, from when she was about 20 years old of uh, Judith um, beheading Holofernes. It's from uh, one of the uh, books of the tradition of, uh, of uh, the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, this painting is from uh, 1612 and 1613, I think, and she painted another version of it about 10 years later, uh, where Judith is wearing a different colored dress and a few other things. But anyway, um, you, you could look up the story. Uh, the, the, it'd be nice to, st to study the painting, but that's not really our purpose. Um, I want you to just notice, though, you know, she's slicing this guy's head off. Um, and I want you to try to put yourself in her position or the position of the other woman there who's helping. Um, and just think what it, what it would be like if you were doing this. You know, it's the same kind of thing I asked you to do when we looked at Jesus kicking the money lenders out of the temple. Like, I want you to try to, uh, instead of just looking at this as a scene, try to think, okay, what would it be like if you were doing this, not, not if you were staring at it? Um, so I presume you haven't beheaded anyone. Maybe you have. Uh, but, uh, but you probably had to do something intense. Uh, so think about this. And I'd like you to think about, uh, you know, notice, notice her hand holding his head down. And her other hand that's, uh, you know, pulling the sword across his neck. Um, and meanwhile, the other woman up there is using her hands, I guess, to hold, to restrain the, the hands of Holofernes. I guess that's what she's doing. Um, so I just want you to look at all the hands, the women's hands, and to, and to think about how they function experientially. Right. So I'm asking you a phenomenological question. If you, if you could imagine yourself in a situation, you know, roughly comparable to that, I'd like you to try to give a phenomenological description of your experience of your hand. And the main point I'd like you to think about is that, quite simply, she's doing something and so the hand is involved in doing something. So I'd like you to think about the hand as the means by which, or maybe I don't want to use the word means, although that's fine, but let's say the way by which something gets done. So, you know, you can say she beheaded Holofernes, and that's correct. But that, that beheading, you know, required, you know, some pretty specific actions. It required, you know, uh, fingers and an opposable thumb and a palm to wrap around the handle of a sword, and it re uh, required this other hand to press down on the head and so on. Um, and so the, the doing of that thing, of that act, was accomplished through very specific bodily behavior. And if, if you imagine those hands, you know, the, the, the one hand 
if it's if it's experienced something, it's experiencing the demand of pushing that head down, a head that is no doubt resisting it. And she's probably feeling that, you know, the guy's head trying to push back. Um, and the other one, you know, she's pulling that sword across his throat. And, um, you know, if you think of what it would be like to do that, um, you think, what would you be feeling? Like he, I think your experience would primarily be of that sword pier piercing the flesh. And it's kind of a rough feeling. I don't know if you've ever had to do something like that, like had to cut someone's skin maybe to get something out. Uh, I once had to give someone an injection with a really big needle and a really big syringe. And it's quite something to push the needle in and feel it going into a person's body, you know, a big long needle. Um, uh, the thing that I want to say there is the experience you have, and I'm trying to describe this, you know, I'm trying to do phenomenology. I'm trying to describe the form the experience takes. The experience you have is that feeling of that needle going into the flesh seems to me that's certainly the experience I had and I imagine that's what Judith's experience here is of the sword going across the neck um, and I'd like you to think about in that context then uh, how she experienced in the, in the case of the hand pressing down the head how she experiences her hand and how she experiences the head in the case of cutting his throat how she experiences her hand how she experiences the sword, how she experiences the throat. So from the point of view of the photograph, those things I just named are all basically equivalent. You can see a hand in the painting, a head in the painting. You can't see the neck, but you know where it is. You can see the sword, you can see the hand on the sword. So they just look like, uh, in that case, five equivalent, <clears throat> uh, for lack of a better word, objects. But. From the point of view of her lived experience, it seems to me that that would not be what they're like. Uh, uh, starting with the head, I think that uh, Jew's experience would largely be of the head, you know, trying to fight back. And her hand is the means by which she is holding that head down. Um, in the other case, the hand is what is allowing her to pull the sword across her neck. But it seems to me her experience is going to be either of the sword uh, plunging into, the, you know, cutting through the flesh or the, the, the handle that she's holding. It seems to me the thing that she's not going to be experiencing as such or as an object in either of those actions is her own hand. Her hand is going to be basically that by which she holds down the head and that by which she has an experience of the head. And the other hand is going to be that by which she pulls the sword, and the, that by which she has an experience of the sword. But in, in, in uh, bringing those things into her experience, it seems to me, her hands will actually recede from her experience. That was an attempt to say something quickly. And I want to talk a little bit more specifically about a couple of those points and underline what it is I'm trying to say. And I hope that uh, that will make the, the whole thing a bit clearer. The basic point I want to make there is that uh, in the context of action, or which, which also means just in general in the context of experience, your relationship to your own hand or my relationship to my own hand or her relationship to her own hand is quite different than my or your or her relationship to the things in the world we interact with through that hand. So, um, you know, if, if I pick up a coffee cup, the, the hand is basically that by virtue of which I'm able to pick up a coffee cup, right? So, you know, in my experience, I think, oh, I want to have some coffee. And there's a coffee cup there. It's my hand, or more fully, my body, that lets it be the case that I can relate to that cup of coffee as, as a drink, as a tasty drink, as a refreshing drink, whatever it is. Um, or, you know, I want something that's high up in the cupboard, and I can get it. And basically, that it, it's, it's my body and my hand that lets me do that. Um, but, the, but the thing is, when the, the, the body, sorry, the cup that is something that I pick up, 
and I pick it up with my hand. But my hand is not something I pick up. Right? It's by my hand that I pick up the cup. But how do I move my hand? I move the cup with my hand. How do I move my hand? C clearly, I move my hand in a way that is, you know, radically different in kind from the way that I move the cup. And indeed, uh, it is I who pick up the cup. So it's not, it's not even that there's me and an intervening thing, which is my hand. It is my picking up of the cup is that hand going out and grabbing it. Right? So if you, if you think of that example of picking up the cup, the hand is that by means of which I am enabled to, or I am able to get the cup and drink it. But that hand is me. It's me in my ability, with me as my ability to interact with the world. And so again, from an outside point of view, from the point of view of the photograph, my arm looks like a thing in the world. My hand looks like a thing in the world, just like the cup or just like the sword in, in uh, uh, Gentileschi's painting. Uh, but in my experience, it's not like that. The, the sword or the cup is something other to me. The hand is me. And it's by my hand that I move the cup or the sword. But there is no comparable thing to say about how the hand is moved. The hand moves as the direct and immediate expression of my will or of my desire. So I desire to have a drink. And because of that, I reach out and move the cup. But the cup moves in accordance with my desire because I engage with it in a bodily and mechanical way. My hand moves in accordance with my desire for some other virtually magical reason. It does it because it's me and because it exists as the direct means for the expression of my will and my desire. And so, so I wanted you just to start thinking about that, about the, the hand in those kinds of actions. And as I said, I thought if you started by looking at this picture, uh, you might start to, to see you know what that what that uh, experience is like those things i was just saying are, are, are really the core of what sartre is trying to s say in this section so if you understood the things i just said then you understand the point of this section and everything he says is really a, a f exploration of that an elaboration on it. back on page uh 403 he he gives i think the the most basic description of what the body is a uh, as a, something you live He's, he's talking about what happens when you sort of look at your leg in the doctor's office and so on. He says, what I cause to exist here is the thing leg, but it is not the leg as the possibility which I am of walking, running, or of playing football. Right. So he's saying that your leg as you live it is the possibility to engage with the world, the possibility to do. And that's what I was just saying about the hand. So he says that in 403, and then he's it's really... The, the, the core analysis of this whole chapter, I think, is basically 422 to 427. And that's where he's really exploring that in some detail. And I think especially on pages 426 and 427, um, uh, he, he, really, um, he really brings the, these ideas out especially powerfully. He, he says, especially on 426, 426 um, I am not in relation to my hand in the same utilizing attitude as I am in relationship to the pen, or I could have said, as I am in relationship to the coffee cup, or Judith could have said, as she is in relationship to the sword. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm not in relation to my hand in the same utilizing attitude as I am in relation to the pen. I am my hand. Or again, you know, he says this at the end of that first paragraph on 427. He says, uh, I don't have to adapt myself to um, my body nor to adapt another tool to it. It is my very adaptation to tools. It is the adaptation that I am. Um, so that so I, I just wanted to quickly just point to those passages on 403 and then 426 and 427 uh, to remind you that those things I was talking about are the, the core point he's trying to get at there. Um, but I want to go and talk about a couple other things to, just to try to bring out some of the some of the sense of this or some of the meaning of this. And I said I wanted to talk about Aristotle and Kant. Well, I want to start by talking about Aristotle for a minute. Here, I want to... Um, connect with one of the central themes he talks about in this chapter, which is the theme of sensation. Uh, and I want you to think about um, uh, what's going on in in the way that you relate to the world through these bodily 
organs eyes ears nose you know your skin flesh um i want you to think about what's going on in in that what we would broadly call the sort of sensory relationship to the world but to do that i want you to get away from probably the ways you're familiar with you most familiarly do that when you just think about people and you imagine what's going on in your own experience i want you to forget about people for a minute and think about uh, the rest of the animal kingdom uh, because i think that getting getting out of a sort of human focus human centrism you might even say uh, can clear away a bunch of obstacles that get in your way of thinking about what sensation is like so you know horses and cats and and so on uh, they have you know pretty developed sensory awareness too and i wanted you to try to think about the experience of of those organisms and that's why i bring up aristotle because aristotle is the guy who really uh so powerfully studied all that so i want to look at this picture here look this is a picture of a lion hunting a zebra and i want you to think about again a sort of phenomenological thing try to imagine that lion's experience um and the 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 relevant thing here is that that i want you to think about is kind of the uh coordinated character of the various facets of her experience towards a particular end so that zebra is running away and the lion's like yeah good to get some dinner right and so she is in pursuit remember the 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 key text that we've been relying on uh in sartre is uh from page 74 remember we've talked we've done this one many times the consciousness of man in action is non-reflective consciousness it is consciousness of something and the transcendent which discloses itself to this consciousness is of a particular nature it is a structure of exigency in the world and the world correlatively discloses in it complex relations of instrumentality well it seems to me that the the lion chasing the zebra here is a excellent example of exactly that structure so that structure he's just described of our pre-reflective consciousness which is our, our everyday consciousness uh, is more or less the structure of animal consciousness um, in this sense right if you again if you look then at this picture um, that uh, that lion presumably experiences that uh, zebra as something to be caught something to be pursued and it's her um, pretty pretty much un undistracted unflinching attention to that that orients everything that's happening so you know her movements the way she responds to the situation around her the rocks the dust the, the whatever else there is the brush that she might see um, her own legs uh, everything is um, meaningfully defined in terms of the project of catching that thing uh, and so that's you know it's 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 as the zebra runs as the prey as the goal moves off that the exigencies present themselves and correspondingly disclose instrumental complexes like oh i gotta jump over here or whatever right uh, all at this non-reflective level um, uh, so if you go back and think about the way we talked about our own behavior you should be able to see yeah that's more or less what you would think is going on here and so the 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 lion's body sort of rises up to service in response to the demands of that uh, project of catching the zebra um, and her her legs and her head and her tail and whatever else will move differently in accordance with the demands of chasing and and pouncing on that on that zebra uh, and in that way her whole body is responding to the situation roughly the way i was talking about uh, my body responding if I reach up to get something in an upper shelf or when I pick up the coffee cup or when Judith um, uses her hands to push down Holofernes head or to cut his throat open with the uh, with the sword um, so I'm hoping that that point already then is clear enough now I want to add one more layer to that and that is that you think how is how is the lion able to do that how is it that she is able to be connected to this other animal that's whatever you know 20 feet away from her um, uh, how can that other thing 
be present to her in her consciousness such that it can uh, appear as a structure of exigency and she can be meaningfully responsive to it. Well, that's what we would call her senses, right? It's because she has sense organs that she can be practically engaged with this being that is at some distance from her. Right? She can see it, she can smell it, she can hear it. Uh, and later when she jumps on it, she'll, you know, feel things tactile wise, you know, her limbs and her joints and all those sorts of things. The body as a motor being uh, is responsive to the exigencies presented by the situation. Her body as a sensory being is a, is, uh, is highly analogous. It lets a situation with its exigencies present itself to her. So the, the lion, any animal, is, is a kind of coordinated sensory motor system uh, that, uh, su such that uh, the situational exigencies, which are defined by the, more or less by the vital needs of the species, her species, the lion, right? The exigencies of the situation speak to her as a sensory motor system and the her sensory motor system is the the way the the, the resources by which the way by which she is able to carry out a project a task which is basically lioning and lioning is is in this context you know catching zebras for lunch so the thing i'm, I'm trying to get you to see there is that I used the word coordinated a few times, and I used the word integrated, uh, I think, once. The thing I'm trying to get you to see there is that she is essentially a kind of life form. She's carrying out a kind of project, but, the pro but what that project of being a lion amounts to is a specific way that a world is disclosed to her. Uh, and the, the world that, the, that we as observational you know, zoologists or whatever would call the world of zebras and um, whatever grassland and whatever else we might say um, those are our terms as scientists you know but the terms for her are are the the terms of you know food shelter what you know the, the world as it speaks to the needs of her life form right so the the world presents itself as a series of things to respond to in order to carry out the being, the kind of being that she is. And of course, that's not a thought the lion has. Presumably the lion isn't even a thinking being, but those are those are things at a non-reflective level that are, um, what we're doing is articulating what the intelligence is that is in her behavior. And it's the intelligence of a life form enacting itself through a meaningful engagement with a world that presents itself as a set of exigencies that's, that speak to her vital needs. That's the, that's the kind of meaningful structure of, of all of her behavior. And that behavior is played out through her sensory motor organism. Right, the, her sense, her, her herself as a sensory being is what lets those exigencies be present to her, and herself as a motor being is roughly what is what lets her uh, respond to them, and so the point there is sensing and movement are both. Uh, what's the word I want to say? They're already charged with meaning. Her sensing and her moving are not. In neither case, neither the sensing nor the moving. Is this a neutral assembling of, uh, of data? In both cases, uh, in sensing and moving, like she senses as a lion and she moves as a lion. Right? The, the, the terms in which her, her sensory life is played out for her are, the, are those very terms of uh, exigency and, and responsiveness. So that was so then the, so I want to say there that both the sensory system and the motor system and the lion, um, those things already are defined in terms of and speak in terms of her life form. And then the second thing that I want to say is just as they're each integrated with her, they're integrated with each other, right? She senses 
in terms of her movement, and she moves in terms of what is sensed. So, so, th so this is then, in, in sum, the kind of Aristotelian point that I wanted to make. The core conceptual point you'd find in his discussion of the common power of sensing in Book 3, Chapter 2 of the, of the work on the soul, and then all tons of stuff he says about sensation and motion. But, the, but the, basic, the basic point is that the animal is a kind of single integrated reality that is realized through its motion, its sensing, and all those other things. Right? Um, it's, it's, it is the lion who senses, and she senses as a, as a lion, and she senses through her eyes, or with her eyes, with her vision, but vision is not like a just a separate neutral thing that she then has a second level of interpreting and responding to. It is, it is she as a lion who sees. Uh, and uh, so that's then the thing that I want you to think about uh, sensation now in the person. And this is the point that Sartre makes. Um, there, there, you know, we're in the we're in the habit of. Uh, talking about sensations as if that were a part of our experience. And Sartre says that's, that's, that's virtually never a part of our experience. experience. Uh, what we, what, uh, if we describe our experience accurately, truly, as it happens, which is what our phenomenological project is to do that, we'd have to say we see things. Uh, and so as he says um, uh, on page 416, he says, you never have a sensation of green as such. On the contrary, you see a green book or a green leaf. And green green is something you already experience as of something. In fact, you might not even notice the green. You might just notice the thing. Like I, I've, an example I've often used is pe the color of people's eyes. Like obviously, at a, some kind of physical level, my eyes must be registering the pe the color of people's other people's eyes. And yet, I can see people for a long time and not ha have ever noticed what color their eyes are. Uh, I just see the person. And it's actually a matter of shifting focus, in that case, to notice what color the eyes are. Um, you might think back to his discussion of the figure and ground on relationship from around page 41. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the point is, you, we, don't, we don't have a bunch of discrete things which are a set of experience of colors that we then sort of look at again and think about again and build up some story about the world. On the contrary, we see things, and the, it is in seeing the green, I see the leaves. Right? Uh, I, I immediately, through my apprehension of the green or, th or through my recognition of the green, have a thing presented to me. I want to show you one other picture. This is a um, Venus Williams, great tennis player. And I, and I guess I want you to think about her experience here in relationship to that ball, kind of on the model of the lion going after the zebra. Uh, you know, it seems to me here um, you can see basically the same thing. Uh, a s s you might say a single-minded orientation towards, not exactly prey, but that moving ball, which is itself the means by which she's going to score a point, which is in turn the means by which she's going to win the game, etc., etc. Like there, there are these layerings of what the project is she's involved in. But the immediate demand is that is to get that ball in everything in her being as a sensory and motor being is oriented towards um, making that making that happen. What what comes first experientially is the, essentially the perception of a whole world. You see the green of a thing and that thing is in some place in a larger meaningful situation. We are we are, um, as Heidegger says, uh, beings in the world. We never have the experience of being a kind of separate bubble of consciousness that somehow has to go out and find a world. Rather, our experience uh, is always already wrapped up with a world. Um, and that's more or less what Sartre said uh, way back in the introduction when he talked about the way that consciousness is, has always sort of already transcended itself in the apprehension of, of reality. Um, but he's 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 uh, exploring that sort of in more detail here to say, you know, the the you always find yourself in a world already articulated um, in terms of meaningful paths and pursuits and so on, uh, and that's the structures of exigency we talked about before, and that and that world is 
revealed to you by vision and by hearing and all those sorts of things. But it, it is that, that having of a world that brings to your attention the reality of sensing and makes sensing something you can investigate, not the other way around. It's not sensing that you start with that, that then somehow allows you uh, to come up with the idea that there might be a world and go out and try to construct that. And, th and that's what he means on page 420 when he says sense is not given before sensible objects, right? You don't, you don't have uh, the, the, the life of being a sensing being before going out and seeing and hearing things any more than you have the life of being a conscious being in general before you are conscious of something. Right? The, uh, just as your consciousness, in a way, has to always be read back from an experience of the world, so do your senses always have to be read back from the experience of that which is sensed. So, so that's, you know, that's the, again, the, the sort of um, core point he's trying to make about sensation there. But he said, there are a couple of other things he says in there that I want to draw your attention to. And so, and one of them is this, he, he says, you know, he talks on page 411 about the inept exper experimenter who says, are you having sensations of this or that? And Sartre says, well, you know, if you're in that context of that experiment, um, you've probably learned how to respond to sentences like that and don't even notice the problem in them. But he says, in fact, there's nothing in your experience that corresponds to that. You're not having sensations of anything. You're seeing something or other. Right? Um, and, uh, and so he, he then talks about that. Uh, he says that this comes up in a variety of places. You will have noticed it. But he says in general, you know, um, you don't, the, the very way that you experience what we might call sensations is as revelations of the character of the thing. So uh, it, it's not that you have a sensation of hot, you experience hot water, right? It's not that you have some uh, experience of, of uh, pressure or something in your finger, you feel a hard surface, right? The very way so-called sensory qualities are given to us is as characteristics of the object. And, and I, you know, I mentioned, I said I was going to talk about Aristotle and Kant. Well, this is one of the things about Kant. Kant uh, has a really great analysis of that in the um, section of the Critique of Pure Reason called The Anticipations of Perception. And he makes this same point, that the very way sensation is given in our experience is as the revelation of a, a, a quality of the object. So that was the, the point then, part of the point I was trying to make when I was talking about Judith uh, and the sword. If she feels anything, she doesn't feel her hand. Rather, with her hand, she feels the sword. Um, but I actually wanted to make a further point in relationship to that painting that, that takes this even a step, a step uh, farther. And that is that, remarkably, you know, if you're holding the sword, and this is the point I was making about sticking the needle into someone's leg or whatever, if you're holding the sword, cutting that leg, you know, uh, the, the, the inept experimenter with a theory about perception would say, oh, you must be feeling sensations at the end of your fingers. And you interpret that as um, the feeling of the sword. And then you must be feeling, you know, whatever, uh, some vibrations that you interpret as the movement of the sword and you interpret that as responding to the pressure in the neck and so on, right? That's, that would be some theorist's reconstruction. But phenomenologically speaking, it's just false. You actually feel the throat being cut by the sword. You feel the needle going into the skin. Um, now, if if you uh, now that's that's kind of that's kind of surprising because you would have thought your sensation would stop at the limits of your organic body. But um, uh, experientially, it seems that that's not true. We we uh, experience things at the essentially at the place where they're happening and in that sense the sword in the example of Judith just as I was saying you know the hand isn't really an object but it's that by which I grab the teacup or that by which she grabs the sword well, I'm saying the sword actually can can assume an analogous function it can become a kind of extension of your body as such that it is not the object of your perception but it is that by which you slice somebody's throat and it actually becomes essentially a part of your lived body. That's the thing Merleau Ponty uh, talks about quite a bit. Um, but uh, but I just, but but I just wanted to name that and give it to you as a thing to think about. As as 
as you're trying to be honest and accurate in describing the form in which you actually experience something like that activity of slicing a throat or whatever a corresponding experience might be that you that you actually have so i think that's the that's a that's the core thing uh, i wanted to say that's a that's a quick introduction to this section i, I hope that one of the things that that my remarks have been able to bring out is this core idea that he says on page 427 sort of in some of summary of this that that the body is lived and not known um, and you know he's talking in all these ways about how your body as that by which you are able to be in the world uh, can never itself be uh, for you just one of the objects of the world you can't ever adopt the attitude towards it of knowing that you can adopt towards other things but you live it um, and um, uh, and so he, he also says then you know t to the extent that your body is your practical way of being meaningfully engaged in the world the whole orientation of the world in a way points to and speaks to you of your body so even though you can't ever know it it's kind of announced in everything uh, in everything that that's uh, that, that's around you in everything that you do uh, and so your world and the body are kind of correlatively disclosed. The, the world is disclosed, as he says, in this kind of hodological space, this uh, space of paths, space of, um, you know, it's not like a map and an atlas. It's it, the world is disclosed in terms of your roots into things like the lion. Um, uh, and and that notion of roots into things is is the flip side of the notion of you as a someone who does things and that is your body is your capacity for that so the world and your body are kind of co-disclosed and co-defined and that's why he also says in a sense your body is almost like the whole world since it is that which gives sort of orientation and meaning to this totality and that totality is kind of that by means of which your body is presented to you even though you can't ever exactly directly know it as in in its in its role as your living ability to interact um and so i really like the line uh maybe i'll just end with this right now on 429 when he says uh, in one sense the body is what i immediately am uh, in another sense i am separated from it by the infinite density of the world it's like it's what you most immediately are and yet it's also a thing that you can never actually get to uh except in so far as the whole world announces it to you um and again i mentioned kant again and, and there the things he's saying there are are uh, very very much like what kant says about freedom in general that idea that you live it but you can't know it uh, and i might add another one too i mean i think this this uh in light of that 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 particular remark about kant on freedom you might go back and reread kant's analysis of what he calls the third antinomy and it seems to me sartre's discussion here is a is a beautiful and brilliant commentary and working out of the implications of Kant's analysis of the third antinomy both in terms of this notion of the body as being for itself as as sort of working out what Kant is saying about freedom but also you know uh, in um, up until about 423 he's trying to show you a, the problem in the way we commonly construe the senses and we commonly construe the body and the point he makes there about the problem of a kind of causal explanation that is um, lost in a kind of infinite regress is ex again exactly the point that Kant makes uh, in, a, in an analogous way in, in this discussion of the third antinomy. So I'm, I'm not going to explain those things. I actually have some lectures on it that you, that you could see if you wanted to go through it further. But I just mentioned that as a point of further study. Anyway, the, but the, the overall point I wanted to make was just that idea of the lived body as opposed to the body that you might know and how it is that by which you have a world that by which you engage with things um, but but for that reason it can't ever be an object to you and your 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 body in that sense is what you are it's not some other thing you use it's that by which you're able to use other things but you don't exactly use it you are it um, and uh, I wanted to relate that then to back to that theme of the response to exigency and use that to talk about how we need to think about sensation uh, and not in the kind of reductive ways we often talk about it, but as something, you know, 
a more like a vital process. I, I say vital, that's not quite right, because it's not just about life. That would come closer to being what we might say about the tiger. But so in that case, it's an existential process. It's it's part of the way through through which it's it's the the, the bodily resources by which our world with all its existential significance is disclosed to us. And and I also wanted then to, to bring out sort of how the in that sense the your eyes or your vision is sort of like a hand, right? In the same way that we talk about what the hand allows you to do, but in a kind of meaningful engagement, we're well, sort of saying that's what your senses do too. Hearing, seeing, they're kind of they they kind of responding to the world the way a hand is responding to the world. Um, anyway, so those are some so, some introductory thoughts on this chapter, uh, and I hope that uh, helps you to make sense of it a bit.